Good morning. I am glad you are able to take some time this morning to devote to worship. And in the continuing theme of uh, last week of unexpected uh, backgrounds and situations, uh, I am not at the Shelby the Methodist Church, and I'm not actually in the woods. I am sitting in my den, completing the last uh, part of uh, the Kuhn family quarantine, and wrapping that up in the next uh, shortly period of time. And then next Sunday, uh, we'll, I'll be able to be back in person in worship, uh, and I'll be back to normal or as normal as uh, <laughs> these times are. I don't think I have any other announcements. And so we'll dive right back in, uh, picking up where we had left off two weeks ago. The church as we know it began with Paul and people like him responding to God's call on their lives and going out and forming churches. Paul wrote over half of what we now call the New Testament, and this uh, uh, and what that is, is letters of him binding the churches together, binding them to himself, uh, advising the churches on how to continue to be church. And, and so uh, it might wonder, how did Paul know it was time to go to a new city? And Paul went to city after city after city. He wrote to church after church after church. How, how did he know it was time to move on? Well, sometimes he moved on to the next city because the work was done, because Everything that needed to be taken care of was, and he had created a self-sustaining uh, group that, uh, or he had pulled together a group of people that had become self-sustaining by uh, turning to following Jesus together. And uh, so sometimes he moved on because it was just, it was time. And sometimes he moved on because he was not given a choice in the matter. And that's what happens um, at Philippi. Uh, in the first portion of Paul's letter to the church at Thessalonica, the Thessalonians, that's what we're looking at today, he, he references how um, that, that was what had just happened to him. He had had to leave Philippi uh, because it had gone poorly. If you read Acts 16 and 17, you'll find that the, the story of that, um, what, what exactly happened, but basically the, the leaders of the community hustled him out of town so that uh, it wouldn't turn into a big old fiasco of a situation because they hadn't exactly handled affairs well. And so Paul rolled into Thessalonica and he started doing his thing, started working there, gathering up people who uh, he was working with, gathering up people who were interested in what he was sharing with the broader community, bringing in people from the Jewish community. And then uh, he started a church there. And then down the road, he, he moved on, and uh, that that we have this letter that, that we're reading, this letter that we call First Thessalonians, this letter is proof that what he was doing worked. Like, it, it's proof that it worked. Paul's, uh, beyond just Paul's praise for them as being a church that other churches desired to imitate, because uh, he, so he's hearing about how uh, the other churches of, of Greece are, are looking at uh, Thessalon uh, the church at Thessalonica and saying, we want to be like them. But the fact that we have this, this letter from Paul, like it, it shows us that they were still there to write a letter to. It worked. What he was doing worked. What he was offering as good news was being received and was being experienced as true as this is really good news. And so while Paul was not run out of town like he was at Philippi, right? at Philippi that was rough, right? that doesn't mean that in his time at Thessalonica everything was, was just peachy. Right? Uh, does not mean that this does not mean that the community embraced and supported everything that Paul in this new church was doing. Paul reminds in, in this first and second chapter of Thessalonians, Paul reminds the people of the church of their suffering at the hands of the, the Jewish people in their own town, uh, which was in line, he reminds them, with what the first church, uh, the church back at Jerusalem, he reminds them, this is what the first church had, had gone through. They'd caught some flack as well, um, which is not uh, to be taken as an argument uh, is it quote, point at Paul and say, because of this is where Paul says this, this is an argument that uh, Christians should be against Jews across all time. This is not a, a support for anti-Semitism. This is looking at a specific situation in a specific town and saying, well, this was a, a moment when some Jews gave some Christians a hard time. And that, that's what happened. They, they went through and endured some, um, some struggles because of that. And it kind of makes sense. Uh, well, it doesn't kind of make sense. It does make sense. Uh, 
if you start looking at the situation at Thessalonica. It was a city that was under Roman control, and that was about it. Rome really hadn't sunk that deep into the community. And, and we know that through things like, um, we've done some excavations at Thessalonica, and what we found there in the graffiti, lots of graffiti in ancient times, uh, just a lot of graffiti all over the place. I was surprised by that uh, when Olivia and I, we took a tour of uh, Pompeii, which was, uh, as you might remember, a town that was uh, the, uh, the, vol the volcano of Vesuvius blew up and, and buried the town. So we had the snapshot of, of this this Roman town from not exactly contemporary contemporaneous to first century Thessalonica, but like it's a Roman town. It's, it's a Greco-Roman town. And, and there was there was graffiti all over the place. I was amazed by that. I did not expect it. And, and when we've done excavations at Thessalonica, we also found, uh, I haven't been there personally yet, yeah, it'd be fun, but we found a lot, we have found a lot of graffiti. And what's interesting about the graffiti is that it's 98% Greek. The language of Rome was Latin. The language of all the culture that came before is Greek. And so it kind of gives us this sense, it lines up with what other parts that we know about the history of Thessalonica, is that this was a community that Rome controlled, but was very aware that it did not like, and like thoroughly soaked in, right? It wasn't like Roman, they were just kind of in charge. And so it made the people in charge very nervous. It made them very picky about things that they, they just wanted to make sure like they weren't running going to run into any trouble and so they wanted to make sure that everybody was towing the line about the things that mattered that things like worshiping the emperor worshiping the roman caesar the roman emperor and, and so you get to this situation where you have the jews of thessalonica and you have the christians of thessalonica and jews in uh roman greco-roman times were seen as wrong because they're monotheists and obviously the, the pantheon is the correct way to view reality. So the Greek and the Romans considered the Jews to be wrong, but they were old and wrong. And so they were respectable. Like there, there was this, there wasn't the assumption that we have today that new is good. The assumption back then was that old is good. And so they were old and wrong. And so we'll at least let them be old and wrong. Let these Christians they're, like the Jews were, were worried because if they, they kept the, this Jewish community, if they kept the Christians in, then if they got seen as being new and wrong, then ooh, this, could, this, could, this could mess things up. They could get in trouble for this. And so they were very clear that they wanted to keep the, the Christians sort of like away from them, keep these newfangled things, uh, newfangled people, newfangled ideas, keep them over there so that they wouldn't get in trouble. And so uh, the Christians, like in, in, in this community that where the, the leaders are very aware that they need to make sure everyone's towing the line, there, there was a, some pressure uh, for them to uh, do, to prove. Like, how do you prove that you're towing the line? You, you bit, burn a pinch of incense and you're willing to say Caesar is Lord. And uh, Christians were not willing to do this. They were not willing to say that Caesar is Lord. And so it's not like the Christians will run out of Thessalonica. But it was a bit tense. Like it was not easy going in, in every way it, it could have been. And, and so the church at Thessalonica, it thrived, but by no means was it coasting. It was maybe you might say thriving in spite of the pressure it was under, but the pressure from the Jewish community there and the pressure from the, the leaders of, of the, the community of Thessalonica. And so this is where we find them as Paul writes his letter to them. And, and it's the first letter we have of Paul's, we are reading the earliest words we have of Paul, written to one of the earliest churches he starts. But it's not early in Paul's life when he writes this, if that makes sense. Like, it was early on when he started the church, but now he's, he's moved on. And so he's writing a letter back, having realized that he needs to check in with these folks on a regular basis. And so he's not writing them because uh, there's a problem. Most of his other letters, the, uh, Galatians, 1 Corinthians, like these other letters, they're written because there is a problem 
he, he's not writing Thessalonians because he, he'll write the second the second Thessalonians he'll write because there's a problem. First Thessalonians, he's just writing to check back in because he realizes he's been gone for a while and it's time to make sure he's checking in and encouraging the churches that he has moved on from. And so how does he encourage them? He encourages them based on what he knows of their situation. He knows that there's this low-key, continuous pressure to conform uh, back in Thessalonica. And so he brings it up. He brings it up near the beginning of the letter, reminding them that when they imitated Paul, that this is how they received the good news about Jesus, and that with the joy of the good news, the joy of the Spirit, also came those tribulations that they started to experience. Tribulations being a fancy word for suffering. And then uh, he brings up suffering again, just a few paragraphs later, he talks about how uh, he's going over what brought them, uh, what brought him, Paul, to them, the church at Thessalonica, and he reminds them, you know, I got run out of town back at Philippi, that's how I came to you, that, that didn't go well, but I came to you after that suffering, and, and uh, my message had been tested and vindicated, and I came to you, and, and it went really well, and I'm very glad for the joy that we had in being together. And then at the end of this, this chunk, this first and second Thessalonians, Paul brings up suf suffering at some greater length. He compares their suffering to the suffering of the mother church, the church at Jerusalem, saying, you know, the same thing that you're going through, they went through back in Jerusalem. And, uh, and then he wraps up this section by pointing out, it is my joy that you are being faithful in the midst of the suffering. Your faithfulness is my joy. That's the source of my joy. Now, Paul ties these two things together pretty closely again and again, joy and suffering, which is not exactly something I expected. I mean, you don't really expect those two to go together. But that does seem to be the theme of the first part of the letter of First Thessalonians, that in any type of suffering, that there is all uh, due to following Jesus, there's also the joy that sustains you through it. And so from the everyday challenges that they had faced since they had chosen to follow Jesus, they had been sustained by the joy of the spirit that uh, even when it become, became greater challenges, when they faced situation, when they might face situations like Paul had faced back at Philippi and the way that he had been run out that, uh, that had led to the joy of him coming to, to them at Thessalonica and them experiencing the good news. Now, finally, he sort of raises the stakes and points out, like, even if the, the suffering is on the level of the early church, how even uh, when that happens, the, the joy is still, the, I mean, Paul is finding joy in, in their, their faithfulness, the, the joy of their con continued following of Jesus. And so the joy that uh, we're talking about here the suffering is pretty straightforward right suffering is what's happening because uh, they follow jesus not everyone does the, the the joy though we need to make sure we understand that the joy is what confirms that the gospel is exactly that that the gospel is good news the joy comes from experiencing uh, the presence of god the kingdom of god here and now being baptized and, and knowing and experiencing being forgiven and accepted into the church. Uh, the peace that happens between people that people that you know, look around at who you're gathered at with church and um, people that you would not otherwise know and would po possibly be at odds with, but here we follow Jesus together and the joy of being gathered together, the joy of sharing a meal, being part of that community, the joy of music that weaves people together to form something bigger than any one of us, the joy of prayer, of study of scripture, the joy of service, all these things, the joys, the deep satisfaction that comes from living the Christian life. Paul, in writing to other churches, it's in one of his later letters, he writes about the fruit of the Spirit, and one of the fruits of the Spirit is joy, that uh, following and being filled with the Spirit of, of Jesus, Spirit of God, uh, that brings joy. And, and that it is connected to suffering. It is not that we seek out suffering or pretend that we don't suffer, because we don't. I mean, we just we can't really avoid it. It's going to happen. And, and that suffering is a natural consequence of committing to following Jesus. We commit to his kingdom, and there are going to be conflicts between his kingdom and how the world runs today. 
whether it's any of those examples that Paul points out, the low key stuff that just happens because of the community you live in, or whether there's a, a specific event like Paul getting kicked out of Philippi, or whether it's something greater and like the continual persecution of the church at Jerusalem. Right, there is going to be uh, suffering. Following Jesus, discipleship will always involve some degree of suffering, yet the joy is what sustains us through that. That's what Paul is pointing out to them, the, the joy that has sustained them. Right? They've experienced this, and Paul is pointing this out to them so that they continue to name and see the way that they are being sustained in the midst of, of what is a real challenge to them. That there's this sense that uh, the suffering uh, has validated like the fact that they can still continue to have joy. I mean, it, it lends some meat, some truth to the their experience of the situation that, that what they have is really good news. This is something that they can lean on. This is not ephemeral happiness, something, a, a passing moment. This is something deep and sustained and, and real. And uh, it, it strikes me that th this is something that, that I, as I'm thinking about the way that they, they, they are leaning on this joy, they're, they're like leaning on it like a walking stick, something to hold them up as they get through the situation. Um, it reminds me of, of something. Uh, there's this moment in the Old Testament where uh, Israel has chosen to lean on something other uh, than God. And there's it's under... Uh, King Hezekiah, I believe, and it's in Isaiah 16, and there's this invading army, and Israel has to choose on what to lean on, and so uh, they, they've chosen to lean on um, Egypt, and so uh, I have a walking stick here to talk about leaning, but now, I, oh, there it is. If I hold it right here, you can see what I'm talking about. Um, they've ch chosen to lean on Egypt as uh, what they're going to lean on in the middle of this, this suffering, this challenge. And, and when um, the invade, invading force, Assyria, Assyria gets to them, the Assyrian leader hollers, hollers at them from the wall, to them at the wall, and says, you leaned on Egypt. And Egypt was like a walking stick that a walking stick of bamboo, a reed walking stick. When you put your pressure on it, it splits and goes through your hand. And, and if you think about what bamboo looks like, it's a tall, uh, looks sturdy, but if you actually grab it and put pressure on it and lean it, it breaks and it breaks at an angle. And so the hand that is holding it, you put push down pressure on it. Also, if you put pressure on it, it will go through your hand. And then if you're leaning on it, it'll like jab up into your side. And, and if you're trying to get somewhere and it's treacherous terrain and set something to lean on and keep you safe, you now have a very sharp uh, piece of bamboo that has stabbed your hand and stuck you in the ribs. And that's not exactly a pleasant image. And, and so I don't know if Paul has this in the back of his mind, but uh, Isaiah shows up to uh, King, the king and says, uh, King Hezekiah and says, you need to lean on God again. And, and the king goes, yeah, I really do. And, and that's the image that comes to mind for me, at least here is talking, Paul is talking about what do you lean on when, when there's some suffering? And, and what do you lean on? And what Paul leans on is the joy he has, the joy he experiences from following Jesus. And he's repointing, he's pointing this out to them again. They already know it. Like he had already explained it to him when he was there the first time, but he's making sure that they understand that this joy that has sustained you, sustained you thus far, it's going to keep on sustaining you. It has sustained me thus far. And I'm sure that there's, there's always, uh, they were grappling with the temptation that we have as well. Like, what's the temptation in the midst of suffering? The temptation is, to, is towards bitterness, to get annoyed at how life isn't fair, uh, to that whether that suffering is significant or lesser or whatever it is, um, reading this letter that Paul writes, uh, we see and we know from other places about Paul's life that Paul has known some very real uh, suffering from the mildly annoying to the one big event to the ongoing challenges. And he has been sustained by the joy of the spirit, the joy of following Jesus, the joy of being in church, the joy of being surrounded by people who follow Jesus with him, and uh, the joy of being connected together. And that is what he is naming to the church at Thessalonica. You're going, you might be going through some suffering, and I'm sure those folks who are giving you flack when I was there, they're probably still giving you flack. 
but let the joy sustain you. In my experience, this is true, right? The joy in, in the suffering and follow Jesus, there is both. There is going to be some suffering uh, due to following Jesus, due to being a disciple, but the joy can and will carry us through. Uh, and I hope that's something that we can lean on. Stay in love with God. Keep on leaning into the kingdom of God. Keep on experiencing the joy uh, when we gather, when we worship, when we sing, when we're in our own devotions, when we're out serving, when we're following in the footsteps of Jesus. It's experiencing that joy, the joy that is both wonderful and is the joy that we need to be able to, to lean on to keep on following our Lord. Amen. Uh, let us pray. Lord, thank you for the witness of Paul, someone whose faith shows us and teaches us even today, shows us how to receive your joy, even in the midst of whatever suffering we might be going through. We pray for all who are impacted by the weather of this weekend that is impacting so many people across this country. We remember all of those who have lost loved ones over the last year of this pandemic. We pray for the continuing wisdom and patience for those leading us through. Most of all, give you thanks for the, for the joy, the joy of being your people, the joy of gathering together, the joy of your music, the joy of prayer, the joy of good news, the joy of all that you offer us, the joy that sustains us through all that is between us and that time in which is your kingdom to come. Kingdom to come. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you this day and always, and may his joy sustain you. Amen.